Uh, shalom. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to be with you at this wonderful university here, uh, here at Herzliya. Um, professor, uh, the Lauder School of Government, um, Minister for Public Diplomacy. Well, sounds a challenge. Um, <laughs> MKs, and of course, uh, my friend Zivi Libani, it's a very great pleasure uh, to be here with you also. Um, we shared many platforms together when you were the foreign minister and I always admired enormously the uh, intelligence and elegance and good effect with which you spoke at those, those meetings and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, also to say that she was always very gracious to me since the very first time she met she informed me that I think in the old days the British had arrested her father. <laughs> arrested her father and her mother, right? Well, we didn't discriminate, so that's, uh, that's a positive. Uh, let's take a positive from that one. It, it's actually part of the, one of the problems in being a former British Prime Minister is that you find that uh, anywhere you go in the world uh, that there is a problem. At some point in the conversation, uh, it's, it's revealed as Britain's fault, um, which, is, which is a great unifying role to play in international <laughs> diplomacy. Um, but anyway, I was, I was uh, delighted to, to come here, and this is an issue, uh, delegitimization, that I've thought about, and I'm going to offer you my thoughts on it um, this afternoon. There are two forms of delegitimization. One is uh, traditional, obvious, and from the quarters that it emanates, expected. And it's easier to deal with. This is attack from those who openly question Israel's right to exist. It is easier to deal with because it is so clear. When the president of Iran says he wants Israel wiped off the face of the map, then we all know where we are. This is not to minimize the threat, of course. It remains and is profound. It is just to say that were this the only form of delegitimization, it wouldn't warrant a conference of analysis, simply a course of action. The other form is more insidious, harder to spot, harder to anticipate, and harder to deal with. Because many of those engaging in it will fiercely deny that they are doing any such thing. It is this form which is in danger of growing and whose impact is potentially highly threatening in part because it isn't obvious. I would define it, this form of delegitimization, in this way. It is a conscious or often unconscious resistance, sometimes bordering on refusal, to accept Israel has a legitimate point of view. Note that I say refusal to accept Israel has a legitimate point of view. I'm not saying refusal to agree with it. People are perfectly entitled to agree or not. But rather, an unwillingness to listen to the other side, to acknowledge that Israel has a point, to embrace the notion that this is a complex matter that requires understanding of the other way of looking at it. The challenge is that this often does not come from the ill-intentioned, but sometimes from the apparently well-intentioned. They would dispute vigorously such a characteristic of their mindset. They would point to what they would say is the injustice of Palestinian suffering, acts of the Israeli government or army which are unjustifiable, and they would say rightly that you cannot say that to criticize Israel is to delegitimize it. Such minds are often to be found in the West, and they will say that they advocate a two-state solution, and they will point to that as proof positive 
that they accept Israel's existence fully. The problem is that though this is true in theory, in practice, they wear Nelson's eye patch when they lift the telescope of scrutiny to the Israeli case. In a very real sense, they don't see it. So, for example, on Gaza, they won't accept that Israel might have a right to search vessels bringing cargo into Gaza, given that even this year, over 100 rockets have been fired from that territory into Israel. Leave aside the multiple investigations relating to the flotilla, upon which there will naturally be heated debate. I mean a refusal to accept that however handled, no Israeli government could be indifferent to the possibility of weapons and missiles being brought into Gaza. I often have a conversation about the West Bank which goes something like this. Someone says, Israel must lift the occupation. And I reply, I agree, but it has to be sure that when it does so, there will be security and a Palestinian force capable of preventing terrorism. They say, so you're supporting, you're supporting occupation. I say, I'm not. I'm simply pointing out that if Hamas, with an unchanged position on Israel, were running the West Bank, Israel would have a perfectly legitimate right to be concerned about its security. A consistent conversation I have with some, but by no means all of my European colleagues, is to argue to them, don't apply rules to the government of Israel that you would never dream of applying to your own government or your own country. If in any of our nations there were people firing rockets, committing acts of terrorism and living next door to us, our public opinion would go crazy. And any political leader who took the line that we shouldn't get too excited about it wouldn't last long as a political leader. This country here is a democracy. Israel lost some 1,000 citizens to terrorism in the Intifada. That equates in the UK population to around 10,000. I remember the bomb attacks from Republican terrorism in the 1970s. There weren't many arguing for a policy of phlegmatic calm. So the issue of delegitimization is not simply about an overt denial of Israel's right to exist. It is the application of prejudice in not allowing that Israel has a point of view that should be listened to. One thing I state repeatedly in interviews about Gaza, despite disagreeing with the previous policy on it, is to say to the Western media outlets, just at least comprehend why Israel feels as it does. In 2005, it got out of Gaza, i.e. ceased occupying it, and took over 7,000 settlers with it, and in return, got rockets and terror attacks. Now, I know all the counter-arguments about the unilateral nature of the withdrawal, the 2005 Access and Movement Agreement, and the closure of the crossings. But the fact remains that there is another point of view, and it is a legitimate one. This then is hugely heightened by the way things are often reported. Here, the televisual images, whether in Lebanon, Gaza, or indeed any field of conflict, Afghanistan, for example, are so shocking that they tend to overwhelm debate about how, how or why conflict began. Because Israel, like the US or the UK, has superior force, and because in such situations, the horrible tragedy is that innocent people die, these images arouse anger, sympathy, and a disgust that at one level is completely understandable, but at another obscures the difficult choices nations face when they come under attack. 
The combination of all of this is then a curious disjunction of perception. I spend large amounts of time here in Israel and of course outside of it in different parts of the world. To those outside, Israel is regularly perceived and portrayed as arrogant or overbearing or aggressive. And yet to Israelis, there is a sense that the world is isolating it unfairly and perversely refusing to see that they too have a right to have their voice heard. And hence this conference. The issue, therefore, is how do we respond? First, there is a clear and vital principle that needs to be established, and actually by us, by those who are claiming that this delegitimization occurs. To criticize is not per se to delegitimize. The fact is there are plenty of Israeli and Jewish voices that passionately disagree with Israeli policy. I am a friend of Israel, by the way, and openly avow it. I have plenty of criticisms. But delegitimization is qualitatively different. It can seem the same sometimes, but it isn't. The one is valid, the other is not. And friends of Israel should be the first to make that distinction. Having said that, however, we should highlight the fact that delegitimization is happening and be vigilant and vigorous 